Hello and welcome to this edition of the Telescope Makers Workshop. My name is Francis O'Reilly and I will be hosting this edition where we'll be discussing a couple of issues. Today I'm working on polishing a 12 and a half inch optical flat. The optical flat has been ground flat and measured with a spherometer down to 5 micron grit. According to the spherometer, which measures in microns, there is no power, at least at the micron level, in this flat. I'm hoping to get it flat down to about 10 nanometers, which is about the limit of how far you can polish Pyrex. I've already polished out one of my three flats, and I was amazed to see that I was able to polish it out thoroughly, completely, in four hours. Having checked it under a microscope, there is nothing left on that flat in four hours of polishing that can be polished out. It is perfectly polished, a deep, thorough polish. Normally, one would think that you would polish about two hours per inch of diameter. So I was expecting to be spending in excess of a total of 24 hours, 25 hours polishing that particular flat. I was absolutely amazed. What is the difference? I was using a Google's uh, 73 pitch lap that had been tempered so that it uh, was soft enough so that it needed to be rechanneled about once an hour. The difference is that I was using a different type of polishing compound. Instead of using the regular cerium oxide, I was using something I purchased from Universal Photonics. And that is number 85 rare earth liquid polish. In 2008, I purchased five kilograms of this stuff and I knew it polished fast and thoroughly. It does. Universal Photonics on Long Island, New York is a commercial optical supply house. They supply all sorts of uh, materials that are necessary for the fabrication both of eyeglasses and also of large optics. Their prices are reasonable, they will deal with the amateur, they're extraordinarily knowledgeable, and I highly recommend them. Today, we will be polishing the flat, the second flat of the three flat series. Now, I don't anticipate that I'm going to spend four hours today polishing. That's just a little bit too much. I generally go one hour at a time. I'm going to be starting with my pitch lap on top because that works the outer edges of the flat. I may spend an hour during the process polishing with the flat on top. That remains to be seen. So that being said, let's get started. Prior to polishing it's important to make sure that your pitch lap is properly channeled. A proper pitch lap should require refaceting about every hour. That's the proper uh, viscosity, the proper temper for a pitch lap. So if you're going for an hour, when you're done, you really need to take a razor blade, a single-edge razor blade, and go over the pitch lap and just make sure that all of the channels are properly open because if they don't, if you don't, and if they're not properly open, then you're going to have a lot of trouble polishing. You're going to get caught up in a vacuum that's created between the pitch lap and the mirror, or the flat in this case, and it's going to make polishing very, very difficult. I don't mind having a lot of drag when I'm polishing because it means that things are working, but sometimes the drag becomes so much that it becomes unmanageable. The facets in the pitch lap help to reduce that so that the lap does flow properly over the work and does distribute cerium oxide, or in my case, the rare earth polishing liquid over the entire work so that things do polish properly. So my next step is to, or my first step, is really to make sure that I have proper facets in my pitch lap. A key to properly faceting a pitch lap is to hold your single-edge razor blade at 45 degrees to the work 
and just take little cuts at a time, just going back and forth. Pitch is very brittle, and you are going to chip off big pieces occasionally. It's not what you want to do, it's just the way it is. That really won't hurt anything as long as you don't take an entire square out. And what I'm doing is I'm making a V in the pitch lap. That's important. It holds the squares open a little bit lighter, gives uh, longer, gives the pitch some place to flow. Another important step is to occasionally take a paintbrush, which I dedicate for this purpose, and I use only for the pitch lap, and to brush the pitch that you've chipped out. Follow these steps, and when you're ready to polish, you'll have a properly pop, you'll have a properly faceted pitch lap. Once you're done channeling the pitch lap, it's a good idea to rinse it off. Not in hot water, not in cold water, in sort of warm, almost room temperature water because you don't want to add a whole lot of heat into the pitch lap. But you don't want to channel it off to get the little pieces of pitch that end up everywhere off it. And you're going to find, if you're wearing short sleeves or no gloves, it's going to end up all over you also. My next step is to take my number 85, which I put a smaller amount with a funnel into a little plastic bottle that I obtained from Edmund Scientific. Uh, they're very inexpensive. You obtain them in, I think, groups of five. I'm going to shake it up really well, and this is a pretty thick mixture as it comes, and that's fine. I'm not figuring right now. I'm just doing the grunt work of polishing out all of the pits from, left over from the number five micron uh, aluminum oxide. And then I'm going to put some on the work. That being done, take the tool, the pitch lap, turn it over, place it on top. This is already fairly well pressed in. I'm going to look at the time, and right now it's a quarter of ten, and I'm going to begin to polish. And I use a W stroke polishing about a third of the way out, a third of the way across, turn it counterclockwise while I go clockwise around the barrel. So I'm never presenting the same radii in two separate consecutive polishing actions, keep things fairly random. Again, I'm not making a parabola, I'm making a flat, and that may make a bit of a difference, but the randomness doesn't hurt. And now I'm simply going to polish for half an hour. After that half an hour, I'm probably going to take the lap off, take a look at it, add some more polishing liquid, and then go back. And the total polishing time today for this session will be one hour. And then I'm going to repeat the whole process again, probably later this evening when my back feels better and do it until this is polished out completely, which I anticipate should take a total of about four hours. Well, it's been a half hour. I've been polishing, and I'm taking a look at it. I really don't need to put more uh, number 85 compound on. The lap has gotten fairly dry twice, and both times I've just added a little water from a spray bottle that I keep at my side. Now these spray bottles are pretty important. You can buy them for about two dollars at Lowe's or at the Home Depot and I highly recommend that you have them. They'll allow you to put water on your work and lubricate it and keep it going. A little adjustable spray nozzle, a, a uh, squirter, and you're good to go. So I'm going to continue working for another half hour until I've got an hour's worth of work in. Taking a look at the blank, it looks great. Don't be fooled. It's a faux polish. There's a long ways to go, and I'll show you a little bit more about that when I'm done with the next half hour of polishing. Well, now I've been polishing for about an hour. Let me show you a photo of what the flat looked like before I started polishing.
Here it is after an hour of polishing. As you can see, it's a dramatic difference. It looks, for all intents and purposes, as if it's completely clear all the way through. This is what we call a faux polish. It is really not clear all the way through. It's really not ready to be called a polished surface. One of the tests we use to determine that is a light test. I take a light and I shine it on the surface. And I can see right here that light is being caught on the surface. When this, po when this surface is fully polished, the light will go all the way through and nothing will be kept on the primary surface. So after one hour of polishing, I have a nice faux polish, but I still have a long ways to go. I'll be polishing this for about another three hours, at which time it should be done. When making optics, it's important to have the surfaces completely polished. If I were to send this surface out for coating right now, it would come back with bubbles all over the place and would be simply unusable. You may have noticed also when looking at the surface that there's a ring in it. This will be a cord flat. I have a one and three quarter inch hole right through the center of the flat measured to within the thousandth of an inch. I will be using it for autocollimation purposes and I will be projecting light through the core uh, to the optic, then it comes back to the flat, returns to the optic and goes back through the hole. So it's for testing purposes primarily. I've drew, drilled the hole to within about 15 thousandths of the primary surface from the back. That's to relieve the stress while I'm grinding and polishing the flat. Once the flat is finished, I will then drill the hole uh, from the front surface to the hole in the back, lining it up very carefully with a microscope so that they match exactly when they meet. It's a bit of a tricky operation, but it's important. One of the things that will happen once that's done is that the edge around the core will turn up slightly. In other words, it will have a bit of power and it will have a bit of radius of curvature. Traditionally, that was fixed with hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is very dangerous and there are new modern chemicals that are available to repair that turned up edge. So for now, that's it for this edition of the Telescope Makers Workshop. My name is Francis O'Reilly and this was recorded on Monday, Memorial Day 2012, May 28, 2012. Thanks for watching.